Welcome back to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik, where we bring you news, politics, and culture without the red and blue treatment. I'm Michelle Witte here with John Kiriakou, turning to more uh, domestic issues and talking about the a little bit more about the, the mixed economic news we got yesterday. Yesterday, we talked about GDP, about interest rates, about the strength of the dollar, etc. Today, I want to talk about corporations, prices, profits, and why so far, you know, after a, a candidate who, who really campaigned on taking on white-collar crime uh, is really just finger-wagging mm -hmm. uh, as of today over all of it that appears to be going on. Joining us for this conversation is Steve Grimbein. He's founder and CEO of the nonprofits Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action. He's the host of the podcast Macro and Cheese. He's an MMT evangelist. Steve, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, so uh, I want to talk about this this report in The Guardian that took a look at whether corporations were really feeling inflation just like us and only adjusting their prices to, you know, keep up with commodity costs. So it analyzed the top corporations' financial and earnings calls. And I hope you are sitting down, Steve, because it found that most of these guys are enjoying huge profit <laughs> increases and passing on costs to customers. So, I mean, catch your breath here. The analysis of SEC commission filings for 100 U.S. corporations found net profits up by a median of 49 percent, but sometimes uh, in percentages higher than 100,000, even as they were saying, hey, guys, look, I know, I know that your paycheck hasn't gone up at all, but we have to raise prices to cover our new higher costs. And, uh, you know, I know you are not asking, Steve, whether their employees are at least making money because you know the answer. They are not. And so in a moment of widespread suffering, economic suffering, there is one sliver of the population who is feeling no pain at all. And it is, of course, the people who can most afford it. And so I, I am just going to give you one detail of one company here. But you can go to that Guardian report and see lots more. But this one company is Chevron. Chevron's. 240% profit spike was part of the best two quarters the company has ever seen. And on this earnings call, Chevron promised shareholders it would keep production low to maintain high prices. And so this is just a great example. These prices are being passed on to the consumer because, oh, God forbid, we can't pay more for these commodities. In the meantime, they're not suffering at all, much the opposite. Uh, so I want to ask Steve if anything else in this report jumped out to you. And then I want to get into how do we reverse things like these price increases, right? Will companies drop them when inflation falls? Are there existing mechanisms to force prices down? Should we be looking into creating new ones? How do we, how do we back up out of this situation? All right. So first of all, absolutely nothing, not one single word in this report, causes me to have any flinch at all. This mm -hmm. is so predictable, it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the people that this report is most shocking to are those people who, particularly on the left, who claim to be woke revolutionaries while simultaneously carrying the bag for sound finance conservatives thinking they're woke. Mm -hmm. They use the same language, they use the same identity, they use the same lens. And then they come back in the left circles talking about the value of the dollar. They start talking about commodity price. It's the same exact thing. And, and it's not going to change because what's happened is all these executives, there is no like uh, automated price increase thing that happens when something triggers, it raises prices. These are all human beings sits there and says, how can we make money? They say, OK, our new policy is we're going to raise prices 25%. And and we're going to say that it's because of this, because all those same lefties out there that are so woke are busy talking about how we're printing money and it causes inflation. Mm -hmm. So they know they've got the Dumbo crew <laughs> saying Dumbo things. And they're like, yeah, here we go. We're going to win again yeah. because the Dumbos are going to do it for us. They're going to cover us, guys. Look at the left. They're over here talking about printing money. We can't, we can't beat this, man. We don't even have to do anything. Get out of their way. Let them do it. Yeah. And that's what's happening. And and it's depressing as a lefty um, trying to talk economics to lefties is almost it's almost easier talking about 
QAnon stuff with righties than it is talking about e-com with lefties. <laughs> and so these guys know that they've got us snowed. They know that we're still carrying the water for a lot of really faulty logic. And they know that we're not terribly interested in learning different. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, this, I mean, this is literally a magic trick. They are literally pulling the wool over our eyes. The media eats it up. The me oh, well, you know, because Biden has spent my Biden hasn't spent squat. In fact, we're heading toward a recession because he hasn't spent squat. Mm -hmm. They're out there celebrating, literally reducing the deficit like and like it's a good thing. But what's happening is, is that when you turn the spigot off on federal spending, you literally create the recessionary uh, condition. Mm -hmm. And so these companies, knowing full well what's going on, are literally jacking the prices up. So none of this surprises me. Not even a little bit. I, I, no. there, was, might have, there was a little bit of time during the pandemic <clears throat> where the absolute supply chain failures shone a very, very bright spotlight on logistics, understanding, you know, national logistics, understanding how we can control our own emergency situations. It shone a very bright spotlight on the problems of global uh, globalism or in this case, you know, multinational farming out of labor around the world. So mm -hmm. we got to experience that, but we never learned the lesson. And because the media is so absolutely all encompassing and, and it is the, the great teller of all the lies, we are filled with this and the companies that pay the costs for those media outlets to put out that propaganda are thanking them in spades. And, and and this is what you've got. So absolutely none of this is surprising to me, not one ounce of it. Steve, I want to ask you about Amazon. Amazon yesterday, after the markets closed, um, announced uh, sharply lower revenue that they attributed to the end of the pandemic, right? People aren't stuck at home being forced to order things on Amazon. But analysts said months ago that the reopening of the economy was already built into Amazon's share price. So it, it seems to me, you know, people are still going to need to buy supplies. You know, I, I, I still need to buy uh, filters for my, for my air conditioning unit, for example. Um, does this mean that things are going to improve for mom and pop stores? around the country that, that small business owners are going to get a little boost for this uh, because of this? Or is this just an anomaly and, you know, Amazon is here to stay. People are going to choose Amazon over local uh, small businesses. What, what exactly are we looking at here? I can't tell if this is good news or bad. I, I think it's kind of like sleight of pen also a little bit here, okay? That's what it seems. What do you have going on in Staten Island? Right now, you got Kristen Smalls revving up the union yep. uh, stuff. So naturally, Amazon's got a totally different war on their hands that they didn't anticipate having to fight, okay? they right. got labor rising up once again. So, you know, when, whenever you're trying, if you're a football player or whatever, and you're trying to negotiate the next deal, the ownership group always comes in and talks poor mouth. They always show the book. See, we're bleeding out, guys. Your salaries are killing us. And then the next day, as soon as they sign it, suddenly record profits in the NFL, right, or whatever. It's the same thing here. I really believe, honestly, that the, the, the days of small mom-and-pop shops mm -hmm. are sadly largely over mm -hmm. until somebody does something with regulation or – you know, really understanding free markets are not free at all. They're government created and it's a government policy, not some miracle hand of the invisible hand. OK, right. And Walmarts of the world have displaced all of those things just as much as Amazon has. So the, the, the small mom and pop shops are competing not just against mail order, but against every if you go down the road, every single community has a Walmart, maybe two Walmarts. Yes. Maybe three Walmarts. And they have the greatest supply chain management ever, even though you could go into them and see the, the shelves were empty, right? Right. And part of this is a business decision. And you saw in the very article that you're talking about from The Guardian how real estate, these developers intentionally slowed the building of, of, of new units out 
to create what, 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 think about I, I, I hate to backtrack on myself, but think about what they do whenever they launch something like PlayStation or Xbox. Mm-hmm. They mm-hmm. intentionally come out with a decidedly low amount, not because they couldn't have produced an extra two million of them, but because they want to create a sense of scarcity yes. that makes that you feeling like you're in an, an exclusive club. Right. That you were the one that got there. It was worth waiting outside Best Buy for six hours in the middle of the night to get your chance in an Xbox or whatever. This is all intentional. They're creating a feeling that you won, the, the, you're a millionaire now kind of thing, you know? And so a lot of this scarcity is there, but you also on the, the real estate side, you gotta realize there's something that, and you guys have talked about, We I think we've talked about it before, and that is that you got groups like BlackRock that have been steady buying up properties all yeah. around the country. Yep, you're right. While they're simultaneously squashing the new creation to artificially prop up the scarcity that doesn't have to be there, while simultaneously not even filling. Many, many of these houses are empty. Mm-hmm. Many of these units yep. are empty. They're just squatting on them. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, th- this is all a rich man's game once again. And it's a political decision by our government to allow it to happen and and none of this is is some miracle of god that Mm -hmm. suddenly on high these inflationary prices came as a result of some you know they printed money so naturally the computer says oh we gotta raise rates Mm -hmm. no this is all 100 percent like very very unscrupulous monopolistic uh activities Mm -hmm. we should be getting into the old judge green breaking up ma bell moment as opposed to allowing consolidations constantly that literally leave you without any prayer Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and i'm going to throw one more thing out there that that may or may not resonate with you saudi arabia a few years back jacked down not jacked up but jacked down the prices of uh, of crude why did they do that Think of one of the countries in South America that lives almost exclusively on crude, mm-hmm. right? That they, they, sure. their production is crude. And Venezuela, it's, right? So what do you right. do? Once that happens, they are able to literally bankrupt them into these IMF type situations. They took control by driving the price down. It's the same way driving it up as well. Hey, so Steve. Just remember, this is not. Yes. I'm going to stop you there so we can take our quick break, but we're going to come back and, and continue this conversation. So I'm going to take our quick one o'clock break here. You're listening to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik. We're live in D.C. We'll be back in one minute. Welcome back to Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik, where we bring you news, politics, and culture without the red and blue treatment. I'm Michelle Witte. I'm here with John Kiriakou, and we are con- continuing our conversation about uh, corporate greed and what we can do about it with Steve Grumbine, founder and CEO of Real Progressives and Real Progress in Action. Steve, you were talking about, uh, you know, the way businesses act to ensure their own profits uh, at the expense of everybody else. So I want to ask you to, to finish that thought there. But the other thing I want to ask you, I mean, we've talked about, you know, why this is happening. I want to ask whether there are current existing mechanisms to force prices back down if, as we've detailed, the the invisible hand of the market is is not going to do it. Yeah. So let me let me just finish the uh, yeah, Venezuela please. thing, because I think it's important to see it in both directions, because you can raise prices up the gouge and you can drop prices down to crush your competition by making them mm-hmm. go belly up. And when you look at countries like Venezuela that require foreign reserves that they can only get through selling exports by by acquiring reserves to maintain their balance of payments they when when a place like uh you know saudi arabia the saudi arabian opec type uh companies are uh, you know lower the the price they can literally bankrupt a country like venezuela and bring about those Mm -hmm. conditions that bring it to its knees Mm -hmm. so these are things that happen on a grand scale country to country and they happen on a minor scale company to buyer and seller and, and shareholder. And so the real story here comes down to government policy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have the ability to do various things. We have capital controls. We have price controls. We have uh, regulatory reform. But we really ultimately don't have the apparatus 
in place. You know, it's there in name only, mm -hmm. okay? But a lot of these things are underfunded, these, these monitoring and these auditing and these uh, control mechanisms are, are barely a shell of what they need to be. Uh, and you can see that with the lack of prosecutions for corruption throughout the, uh, the entire finance sector, um, it, it ultimately, it's a paper tiger. Mm -hmm. And so they pay lip service. You have a guy like Biden who is a dyed-in-the-wool neoliberal who, who lives and mm -hmm. dies on this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, hand-waving that we're going to do these things. But ultimately, the types of things they would need to do would sadly look a lot like state-based intervention, yeah. which is counter to every libertarian every neoliberal privatization scheme known to man. Yeah. So all the tools that are there other than hand waving and nice speeches require a real, you know, meaningful step yeah. towards government intervention. And and you know, I'm hey, I'm all about it. I'm good with that. Yeah. They're not. And and so that's I think that's really what it comes down to. Let me raise, since, since we brought it up, let me raise this uh, report that was done by Public Citizen that found that corporate prosecutions, you know, so this sort of intervention, these uh, enforcement mechanisms, had reached a record low in 2021. So it started, it, it was a decline that was accelerating under Donald Trump, but in continued under Biden, again, despite an administration that came in saying they were going to crack down on corporate crime, they're going to make, you know, rich people pay their fair share, that is, again, openly blaming corporations for inflation, right? Mm -hmm. um, the report says prosecution rates have been slowed by some holdover effects of the Trump administration and that Biden has done some good things like increase penalties for corporate crime and widen the scope of who can be held accountable for corporate crimes, et cetera. But as you were saying, Steve, if you, these things exist and you don't use them, they might as well not exist. Um, but so yeah, I, They're underfunded, too, by the way. I'll keep going. I'm sorry. No, no, exactly. I mean, this is it. We've, we've talked about this on the show many, many times. If you are serious about something, then you will fund it and you will staff it, right? But the other interesting aspect of this report found that the Justice Department's use of what are called corporate leniency agreements as an alternative to bringing criminal charges against uh, law-breaking companies remains extraordinarily high under Biden. And I wonder if you could talk to us about some of these corporate leniency agreements. You know, what, what does that look like and what kind of effect they have? Well, let me just be clear. I'm not an expert on this particular area right mm -hmm. here. I, I can speculate with the best of them. Um, but the bottom line is, is that neoliberal politicians, neoliberal business people, neoliberal non-government entities all favor business being free to do what it wants to do mm -hmm. okay so these kind of agreements without having all the specificity necessary to to be able to detail it mm -hmm. fit right into that framework mm -hmm. okay this is this is honestly probably the hardest thing for people to understand is that there is an ideological framework that overlays all of what we're seeing mm -hmm. It's a deep, deeply held belief that business should be king and that government should just be there to arbiter issues of private property. Mm -hmm. and, and at the end of the day, it's there to facilitate their Ayn Randian objectivist goals of achieving the maximum maker level mm -hmm. while penalizing the maximum taker level. Um, I mean, couldn't be more out of Atlas Shrugged if you tried, mm -hmm. you know, Fountainhead kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so while they pay lip service because they would be shot probably in office if they mm -hmm. actually said what they were trying to do, um, they instead, like I said, hand wave at us that they're going to be the most this and they're going to be the most that. Mm -hmm. And these kinds of agreements are just backdoor ways of ensuring that all the rhetoric stays rhetoric and that the teeth are left in the denture jar on the counter. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no teeth to it. It's, mm -hmm. it's nonsense. So, again, if you understand the business model, see, it's, it's, it, I find it challenging because most people default to the word capitalism. Mm -hmm. And while capitalism in and of itself is really a description of a balance of ownership between capital and labor, neoliberalism is a more purposeful definition mm -hmm. of mass attempts to privatize and mass attempts to liberalize markets. It's an entirely different ideological overlay to capitalism 
Um, and, and it's not to downplay capitalism, but capitalism is more of a kind of a, a Rorschach test, a big blot on a paper. It doesn't really have that kind of same detail that you'd like. Neoliberalism right. is a very specific definition and that's what you're seeing there well let me ask you steve i mean i think i i agree i, I don't think that biden administration has any intention of or the the capability of of uh you know meaningfully curtailing corporate profits or or actually cracking down on this crime but we are getting to the point where you know people are people have seen their paychecks really eroded by inflation uh there is actually quite a lot of well Quite a lot of noise in some areas of the press about these uh, astronomical corporate profits at a time when uh, when people are suffering. And so I am wondering if you would expect a cosmetic move by the administration to to give the appearance that they are cracking down on on somebody or other, that they're going to sort of tighten the reins on on Chevron or, or on Steel Dynamics, which is a, another company that comes up in the Guardian report that has been not materially affected by inflation, but had seen their profits increase by more than 800 <laughs> percent. Would you like what kind of a cosmetic move could the administration make to to make it look like they're doing something? I think a cosmetic move would just be great speeches. I, oh, I don't no. think no, oh, boy. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of anything, honestly. I mean, you'll have Elizabeth Warren come out there and tweet her outrage. Yeah. Um, you'll have, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton on one hand uh, enjoying the fruits of all that ill-gotten gains while simultaneously, on the other hand, shouting down about it from the catbird seat waiting for 2024 to see if she can reemerge. I mean, you know, it's going to be a lot of posturing because you've got elections coming up. Yeah. And and just just put it in perspective, right? Biden right now, without any effort whatsoever, other than lifting his Mont Blanc pen to sign student debt cancellation, won't do it. He won't do it. But yet that one thing would make him the most popular president in the history of the United States, probably. Mm -hmm. OK, yep. that one move yep. and he won't do it. So if you think about why he won't make regular people whole by simply eliminating student debt, which is up around two trillion right now. OK, mm -hmm. you don't have to look very far to realize he's not going to do anything substantively on the other side either, because those handlers, those people that pay to keep those politicians in office that fund those campaigns and so forth, they're not going to allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think about this. If you read the other day on the Hill, talk about how Joe Manchin has gone up 16 points in terms of popularity. Yeah. He's only gotten more popular being resistant to this, mm -hmm. being obnoxious and, and obstinate. So if you think Biden is going to suddenly crack back and bite down on the hand that feeds, it, it's not gonna happen. It's just not going to happen. If it does, I will be blown away. Even even a superficial hand wave would blow me away. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see anything coming at all. Zero. All right. Well, let's continue to be depressed and talk about uh, <laughs> Medicare and our health care oh, system. Yeah, I, know. I, I, I no. wish I was farting up rainbows and making everybody happy. I swear it's just that bleak. It really is. It's all right. You know, I mean, when, when there's life, there's hope, right? So it's ha talking about That's the situation true. as it is doesn't mean that you are resigned to it continuing to be that way. Uh, That's right. So let's, uh, but you know, let's talk about our shoddy health care system. There was a report released yesterday by federal investigators that revealed that every year, tens of thousands of people enrolled in private Medicare Advantage plans are denied necessary care that should be covered under the program. And so these Medicare Advantage plans are private insurance plans that offer mm -hmm. Medicare benefits, except mm -hmm. when they don't. Uh, I saw the New York Times reported that these plans are used by 28 million people. Uh, a Kaiser Foundation report saw that shows that in 2020, 40% of Medicare beneficiaries were enrolled in these plans. That was about 24 million people. So it's a lot of the population. And often these plans are less expensive than Medicare, but they carry with them the same restrictions that private health insurance brings, which include, you know, limits on what doctors and hospitals are in your network. So the report found that in the claims it reviewed, uh, 13% of the requests that were denied should have been covered under Medicare. In 2019, investigators estimated as much as 85,000 
Beneficiary requests for prior authorization of medical care were improperly denied. Uh, the plans also refused to pay for legitimate services. 18% of payments were denied despite meeting Medicare coverage rules. An estimated 1.5 million payments for all of 2019. In some cases, these plans even ignored prior authorization. So you'd say, hey, is this covered under my plan? Yes. And then they refused to pay for it. And so here... We have a, a government health care program that is being offer, operated by private companies in the case of these Medicare Advantage plans. And so uh, these results, I think, are not surprising. Uh, the question is, why are we continuing to do this? Uh, you know what? If you hit rewind on this interview. Right. <laughs> I know. I, I if we if we all if we all clung together, locked arms, mm -hmm. and walked down the street together for real, and like blocked traffic, and said we're not moving off this street until you guys understand what neoliberalism is doing to this country. Mm -hmm. If we did that, we'd probably be mowed down or something like that. They'd probably find some excuse to to do. So. But the fact is, is that it's going to take that level of effort. We we've got to make this concept mm -hmm. that known because. Joe Biden will literally, if given the opportunity, will absolutely privatize Medicare. Mm -hmm. He will do that. He's already, he will have no compo no problem with it whatsoever. It's ideologically simpatico with them to privatize these things. It's mm -hmm. ideologically simpatico with Hillary to privatize Social Security. Mm -hmm. All of these things that are not paid with our tax dollars, you got to lose that mindset right. altogether because that's another thing that keeps us in chains. But they literally will privatize all of those out of that very same ideological mm -hmm. um, overlay that is so prevalent. And this right here, what, what is a business's role? To maximize shareholder profit. Shareholder profit comes at a result of reducing costs, and elevating profits. The way to do that is either to cut payroll mm -hmm. or to limit services, especially in the service-based industry like this Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So their role is to be in the service denial business. Yeah. And so this is part of their business model. I mean, it, it's not even Which surprising. It's like, yeah. Which is yeah. an outrage when it's your health care, right? I mean, an explanation offered for why Medicare Advantage should exist is that Medicare's billing structures incentivize doctors to overcare for patients. And so when you put it in the private sector, it's openly acknowledged that the health care, the, the health insurance industry is in the business of denying care. It's in the business of co collecting money. Uh, you know, against future disasters and then denying care when these when these disasters or illnesses fall upon them. I mean, it's it's right there in black and white. And yet that will be pushed. You're right. That will be pushed as a, a solution for our health care system. Let's exp oh, let's expand uh, the ACA to, you know, bring more money to insurance companies. Yeah, this is it. And, and, and I want you to realize this. And, John, I know that you've been around the block, so you know this as well. This is the, the government's business model for the country. This is the economic strategy. Mm -hmm. This is the plan. Yeah. If you notice, the financial sector, the fire sector, their profits are through the roof. Oh, yes. People are making money hand over fist mm -hmm. in the stock market. I spoke to an economist the other day fantastic guy named Eric Dean. And he says, you know something? He goes, the days of Jack Welsh, where they would have all these different companies building things, he moved that to money market cap, money manager capitalism. Mm -hmm. Basically, these companies that they own are nothing more than a portfolio. And, and it's, a, it's a stock portfolio they manage. Mm -hmm. And when a company is no longer number one or number two, they divest themselves of it. Not because they're making anything, but because that's the financial trough that they feed from. Mm -hmm. And it's the same exact thing with uh, with the markets. People are making money. I'm watching people that are supposed lefties that have stopped any kind of meaningful activism and are just literally living inside of investment, uh, talking constantly oh about their stock portfolio, et cetera. Mm -hmm. oh. And you're like, oh, my God, we're losing more activists by the minute. Mm -hmm. This this is it. This is this is where it's going. You know, so what you're seeing is the norm. That's it. That's the game. I was going to ask why then this uh, this propaganda 
uh, about how, uh, you know, private companies always do it better. Privatization is good. It's, it's efficient. It streamlines. It creates competition. I was going to ask why that propaganda is so effective. But I mean, the reality is if you ask the American people and it, you can phrase it in different ways, but if you ask them if they want a, a single payer health care system, they, most of them will say yes. Right. So people do know what yep. they want. And I guess my question is, you know, other countries do not Look, other countries have different health care systems, health insurance programs. They have their benefits and their flaws. But I would say uh, no peer nation and uh, very few of our non-peer nations have systems that are as obviously uh, just blood sucking as ours. And I guess my question is why I, I think the trend is toward Americanization of health care. Right. You see the NHS constantly under threat. You see the expansion of um private insurance in the UK. Uh, why were we first, I suppose, is a, is a, is a question. Why are we the, the, the uh, you know, the lab rats for this, for ne- neoliberalism? And I mean, at Chile, of course, you can talk about the birth of neoliberalism there, but, you know, no. w- why are we the, the cutting US. edge in this? Yeah. So go back to World War II. All right. And you could go back further than that, and I would love to, but you can read Howard Zinn to get some of this. If you start at World War II, though, we had just, quote, unquote, defeated fascism. But we saw Uncle Joe over there in the corner gearing up the communist machine. And so what did we do? We not only meddled with the Chinese revolution that was occurring at that moment, but we then in turn started creating the WTO, the the IMF, the World Bank, and all these other things, you know, the Peace Corps, you name it, to stave off communism from coming. The the neoliberal project began in earnest right then. And so the neoliberal project has always been about liberalizing markets, doing everything that I've already just said, literally everything that I just said. And it started out with the idea of if we take these smaller nations and we help them gain a good capitalist market footprint, and this is before capitalism got where it is today. Neoliberalism had gotten where it is today. But at that time, the idea was, let's make this more appealing to them than communism. And we can keep communism at bay by going in there with these loans to help them facilitate their transition to this modern economy. Well, little by little, as that goes on further and further, the extraction Colonialism took on a different look and feel. Back in the day, we'd go raiding countries. We still raid them, but not the same way. Back in the old days, we'd take over, we'd plant shop, and we'd make it our own, part of our empire. Now what we do is we just create markets, and we use the IMF as the tool for empire to do the very same thing. Mm -hmm. So I've often said that neoliberalism is the U.S.'s top export. Yeah. It is our number one export. We're privatizing the UK. We're privatizing Australia. Mm -hmm. We're helping privatize. We we privatize the damn Soviet Union, right? (laughs) I mean, we are in the business of privatizing. And that is the strategy. So when you see this happening, you must understand history. You must not look in just in this moment, because this moment is is a blink of an eye. It's an instance. It's a Band-Aid on a heart attack. You've got to look at the larger picture and understand this steamroller has been going on for a long time. And so one of the things that – and I just spoke with a Pakistani economist the other day named um, Akhtaz Apsal. Mm. And Akhtaz talks specifically about the beginning of time and the rise of fascism. And what happens is, is when you make government so incompetent, so absolutely feckless, so small that you could drown it in a bathtub, okay mm-hmm. – then it, it, it always will fail you. So every time you point, the, the Republicans, these guys, if nothing changed, if they didn't know any better, these Republicans hating the government, they get some of this right, because, but they think it's, that's just the way it is. And that's naturally government, so naturally it sucks. Yeah. But the truth is, is that they have purposely done this. This is going Mount Pellerin Society, Milton Friedman and that whole gang have been instrumental the Chicago school has been instrumental, and they have been masterful. And this is why when you hear good-hearted lefties want to have a, a constitutional convention, they don't even understand that the other side's been planning that for 50 years. Please do. Please be that bonehead to lead us into that one. Please, we're desperate for you to do it. <laughs> they have been planning this forever. 
And it's not even a conspiracy. It's wide open. This is not like one of those Rothschilds, hey, are we going to make him slip on a bar of soap or spike right. his Earl Grey? You know, this is like real legitimate stuff. This is the model. Hmm. And once you see the model, it stops being confusing. Everything makes sense. It literally stops be that dissonance between what you think you're hearing and what you're seeing. Yeah. You immediately see it for what it is. Yeah. And I think that that is what you're dealing with is that people, while they want single payer, they have been led to believe that government is incompetent. Mm -hmm. They've been led to believe that government is incapable. And yet we are the government that can literally control the globe with a single piece of paper, you know, that we that everybody's so hell bent on this dollar thing. Yeah. But what happens if we lose our dollar uh, reserve? Absolutely nothing. We bring freaking manufacturing back home. Now we've got to deal with the waste and the smog and all the other stuff that comes with mass industrialization again. We, we have all the plants. We just have to bring them back to life. Mm -hmm. OK, it's not it, 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 it. People don't understand this stuff. And so it becomes mystifying and baffling. And, and the reality is, it's just a simple matter that we allowed ourselves to become a consumer of everyone else's goods, extracting their goods for cheap pieces of paper. But what happens when they combine themselves together, like you're seeing in Russia and stuff like that? And they say, no, mm -hmm. now we're going to go ahead. We're, we're good. We're, we're going to do our own thing over here. We don't need to be part of your SWIFT system. Yeah. Well, now all of a sudden, different groups that were dependent on imports from those places are like, what do we do? And so this is what happens when you become a nation full of importers. Yes, you can maintain that for a while, but ultimately the business model will demand more and more profits. It will demand more and more leeway to make the the, the calls, to eliminate government from space. Mm. And, and it will take over and dominate. And you see that happening in the U.S. And the reason why it happened specifically in the U.S. is because that's where our Constitution was even created. It wasn't we, – we, we lionized the revolution that brought this country into existence when in reality the revolution was nothing but a bougie revolution to begin with. <laughs> it's a bunch of rich people that want to pay tithes back to England and wanted to keep their own stuff here. And then they, I mean, you, Zen is masterful in showing how the storage houses would be full of grain and the people would be starving, but they wouldn't give it to them. Why? Because Which they is, needed to discipline the people. I mean, a great, anyway. a great metaphor for today, storage houses full of grain and people starving. Steve, we got to let you go, but, but before we do, why don't you let our listeners know where they can find the work you're doing uh, today? Absolutely. So come to our website, realprogressives.org, and you can find everything. Or you can go to our YouTube channel, uh, which is um, Real Progress in Action. Um, you can also check out my podcast, Macro and Cheese, on Saturdays on all podcasts. It, it's a little audio podcast. Mm. Um, but I'm also, for, for all intents and purposes, I'd like you to know, also I do a show at Status Quo now on Thursday nights called Let's Get Ready to Grumble. And I usually take on one or two or three related items and do a three-round knockout mm -hmm. um, to kind of lay it out. And just last night I took on Elon Musk and this whole concept of private property. Mm -hmm. So catch me all over the place. He's all <laughs> over active. the place. Lots of places to find you. Steve Grumbine, thanks as always for joining us. Thank you both. You're listening Thank to you. Political Misfits on Radio Sputnik. We're live in D.C. and we'll be right back.